Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we go now to our first hot topic. The People's Democratic Party, PDP, has rejected the results of a dual state governorship election in which the All Progressives uh, Congress, APC candidate Senator Monde Opebolo, was declared the winner by INEC. PDP Acting National Chairman Omar Damagum claimed that the election was, uh, was rigged in favor of the APC through collusion with security forces and compromised INEC officials and that their candidate, Asue Godalo, was the legitimate winner. The PDP announced plans to challenge the election results in court, urging Nigerians and the international community to support their rejection of the declared outcome. Our guest this morning is Barista Elvis Asia, legal practitioner. Barista, good morning and welcome to the program. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. Okay. Good morning. Before we get into the intricacies of the election in a do state, let's first of all get your uh, what your red card looks like uh, when you want to score um, INEC in a, a do election. Well, um, the election um, was manned by several challenges, uh, which we should not be hearing at this point in time. INEC has conducted several elections in this country. Uh, one would have thought that you know, most of the issues being expressed now would have been taken uh, care of. Uh, there were you know, so many issues in many areas in the Do South. Uh, elections didn't start on time, materials were delivered late. And the, the ad hoc staff, the NYC people were protesting non-payment uh, non at some point. Um, all of that delayed the process of uh, conducting the election in many places in Edo South. Uh, many people would uh, say that it may have been deliberate to reduce uh, the voters' turnout in the area. Um, you know, there were also issues with uh, vote buying that was very apparent in uh, many of the polling units. Um, INEC officials were there, security agencies were there. Uh, it is uh, shocking that um, not much is being done by INEC uh, in an attempt to uh, nip uh, vote buying at the board because at the end of the day, it strikes at the heart of our elections. Elections should ordinarily reflect the will of the people, but when it becomes uh, purely transactional uh, in the face of INEC and security agencies, then that's uh, cast doubt on the process. I think the most uh, challenging part of this process for INEC was uh, the collision of results. You know, there were so many issues raised around collision. Um, some local governments were moved uh, to to the headquarters without notice and in, in a very uh, in a manner, um, you know, with the use of force by security agencies. All of this will cast doubt on where many elections are conducted. But, you know, uh, we'll give it to INEC. In, the, in, the, in terms of uh, the seamlessness with which card readers were used uh, and all of that. But generally, uh, INEC um, hasn't really done much better than previous elections in terms of the way manner they have handled this election. That worked or that were used and all that. We saw a case of, or cases of uh, overvoting where we saw the number of accredited voters less than the number of the eventual voters uh, according to the result sheets and all that. So how did these um, uh, machines work and they still had these discrepancies within the electoral system? Well, I mean, those uh, stories about over voting are really quite shocking. One would have thought that with the kind of technology we have in place, in, in the beavers, uh, we won't have incidents of over voting because they're supposed to be accredited, they're supposed to be verified to be sure that uh, you are a legi legitimate holder of the card, you shouldn't ordinarily be able to uh, vote more than once. So those kind of cases, again, points to the fact that I didn't do quite well in this election. But um, quite frankly, they are, they are isolated you know, it's, it's cases. Uh, it's not, it wasn't widespread. Um, I want to believe that some desperate politicians in a few areas uh, may have, um, you know, uh, pushed INEC to, uh, you know, have results that they reflect the uh, voters' uh, accreditation or turn or, or register in those areas. It's, it's also, like I said, um, it's something that I didn't do quite well in this election. We shouldn't be hearing of cases like this in an election where we have invested so much funds and resources on technology, uh, you know, in the beavers. 
which only they, uh, so if we have cases like that, it simply means that either the beavers weren't used or that they were, you know, um, manipulated. So how, how come? So, it's, so it was said that um, I think under two hours, you know, IREV was already, the results were already uploaded. So if you're saying that the beavers were not even working, how were they able to collate all of these results? And how come we have a winner already when there's, there's definitely been some irregularities with the election? No, I, I cannot say the beavers uh, didn't work. Um, they worked. Um, it's, you know, uh, I was only really responding to a few isolated cases where it was said that there was uh, overvoting. It mm. was isolated. Generally, the beavers uh, worked. And like you said, um, the you know, results were actually transmitted to the IRF. Uh, but, you know, uh, it turns out later that the condition, uh, according to a lot of the uh, people who were part of the process, uh, uh, civil society organizations, uh, the losing parties, yeah. Have, uh, suggested that you know what was collated in the final analysis did not reflect what you had in the IRF. So um, you know initially uh, it would have been very beautiful to have the results uh, you know transmitted electronically through the IRF so that that can now be used to uh, assess whatever it is that you have uh, in the in the physical copies of the documents, which is the one that is recognised by law. But I next you only be able to compare. So that if what was sent directly from the polling unit is different from what is being collated at the collision centers, and it has the power to compare and uh, ask questions. And uh, even the law now like, gives them a period of seven days to be able to do all of this. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's quite uh, unfortunate that we have a situation where uh, results uh, sent to IRF is now being said to be different from what uh, was collected. It just shows uh, something wasn't quite right in that process. Mm. Yeah, but uh, the same things happened in 2023, and like you said, it's shocking that it's still happening at this time, uh, where we will find that results are not tallying, and uh, INEC is seeming not to do anything about it. Mm. But my question, uh, let's speak into the, um, the, the Electoral Act, you talked something about vote buying and all that, and that INEC has not been able to do their job and all. According to the Electoral Act, is this the, the problem of INEC to arrest the people who are doing vote buying or the police? Or if it is not spelled out, how should it be? Because we need to know who should be responsible for vote buyers. Should it be INEC? Should it be the police? Should it be DSS? What, who is supposed to be responsible? If it is INEC, it don't is, you think they are overwhelmed already? It is, it is it's, it's everybody you have mentioned. But INEC is the organizer of this election. INEC is the one that will require security. INEC is the one that will direct uh, uh, and, and tell security where, where, where it is needed. So they are supposed to collaborate with the security agencies, the DSCC, the police, and other security agencies to arrest people who are found to be loitering around and buying votes. Uh, INEC has their staff, they have their you know, people uh, at polling units who are seeing these people um, you know, obviously buying votes. They, they should be able to allow the security agencies and if the security agencies are not, are not doing anything about it, then they, they, they should tell us uh, so that we can know where to put the blame. Uh, but it is clear that in most places it's a connivance uh, between because for you to be able to succeed in uh, allowing vote buying to inflex the outcome of the election at the polling unit, the INEC staff must even allow the politicians to find, be able to determine who the, these people are voting for. Because ordinarily, if you give me money at the polling unit and if the voting is secret, I should be able to go and vote my my conscience even if I have collected the money. But the way the politicians have, have, have done it is such that you know they are able to confirm whether or not you vote for their candidates. And so this means that there's a collusion uh, between INEC um, or, or at the polling units and the police, the security agencies, and the politicians. So it's the blame uh, has to go around. INEC cannot you know run away from this. This vote buying can uh, will be curtailed and reduced if uh, politicians are not able to verify or confirm. What, who the people they have paid money voted for. Uh, so the fact that they can do that shows uh, collusion and connivance. So the blame is for everybody because um, INEC has the ultimate responsibility to conduct a free and fair election 
and to uh, use use the aid or, 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 or use the, uh, the security agencies to assist them in doing so. And so the security agencies are there. So there should be, there should be a formal way of reporting to say, look, this is happening at the Bagua Center. And so if the security agencies don't act, I next should be able to come out and say, look, we did our job. We tried to prevent this, but that you know, security agencies did not help us. They have never said that. So that shows that there's a connivance and collusion between the police and the politicians. Well, of course, I'm sure everybody expected a free and fair election and expected INEC to do their jobs. Um, but, of course, now there are reports that, you know, there's, there's vote buying, there's rigging, and it's just who rigged more is the best rigger that probably won. Now, PDP has challenged this result. They've said, no, I don't think, um, you know, APC should have won, and they're headed to court at the moment. How do you think the court would, you know, take on this and um, uh, PDP would seek redress? Do you think they might be confident that the court would just overturn, um, you know, the, the results that are in now? And is this where we are today, whereby, um, you know, results are not, being, are not being determined by the people, but instead is being determined by the courts? By the judiciary. My, my, my advocacy has always been for, for people to do the right thing, not only when it is convenient. Hmm. Because just like you said, this is a case of politicians, you know, playing their game, you know, trying to rig the process, trying to buy votes. So it's not a case of who are smarter the other. Hmm. Um, so we must ensure that we do the right thing, you know, so that it becomes a norm. Right now, it's not. The norm right now is for politicians to try to influence the process, try to buy the wishes and aspirations of the people. For the PDP, for example, they conducted a local government election a few months ago in the two state. That was purely a sham. Um, so, you know, right now, that you know, because they had the control of, 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 the, of, the, of the machinery for that election, now it's not the turn of the APC, who seems to have uh, the support of the federal government, uh, security agencies and you know who knows perhaps uh, even the umpire itself and they have not been able to outsmart them and so you know this is something that we all as the people as the people must really fix you cannot be crying only when it does not suit you you should be crying all, at all time and, and insist on the right things being done now having said that uh, yes it is your right to go to the court but we know that you know the political system of the country right now is so structured that politicians have even designed the law in such a way that um, once they have been able to in um, in court, stealing the votes, and, 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 you know, it's almost difficult, almost impossible to overturn it. That's the way they have designed the electoral system. You know, you have to prove uh, almost beyond reasonable that as if it was a criminal case, uh, you have to show that there's no compliance for example, substantially affected the vote, and perhaps you could have been declared winner. So it's a very difficult process. We saw in the 2023 elections, for example, where I led overnight, uh, some assorted against his own regulations and rules to, to transmit a, a, a results electronically, and the court supported them. So, you know, the politicians have exploited these loopholes uh, in the law, and the way of the judicial process um, has, quite frankly, uh, with due respect, uh, uh, been influenced uh, by the society, you know, that we have found ourselves. And so, you know, whether or not you are going to be able to overturn the results is, is a very different uh, issue entirely. And let me speak generally about the results. Yes, there were manipulations and all of that. But uh, sometimes you want to ask yourself whether, you know, despite all of these manipulations, you know, the, 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 the political party actually could have also, also won fairly. Because this election wasn't really about the candidates of the uh, APC, PDP, uh, Labour Party. It was a, a, it was a proxy war between political governors, Baseki and um, Adam Sushumole, and of course, uh, Felicia Ibu that was um, edged out by Baseki. And Baseki has taken out too many unnecessary battles in those states. He is uh, isolated those who brought him, who, uh, who supported him in the second term. In fact, what you call the PDP now in those days, it's not really the PDP. It's just a group of people loyal to Obaseki. The real PDP that used to win elections, that were, better, that do, that were doing well before Obaseki came, have been decimated. They've been thrown out of the party. And they are all now in the APC. And so the, the political force that was against Obaseki in this election was so, was so much that I don't really know how he was going to survive it. 
Once again, you know, even decimated uh, traditional institutions shows disrespect for the Oba. As I am a Benin man, the Oba is the symbol of, of, of my identity. If you take the Oba away, then I'm not like a Benin man. So when you begin to disrespect the Oba, that is going to count in, in elections. And so I don't really know how they're going to succeed in the court, but you know, they have the right to do so. And then let's see how it plays out. Okay, so um, in a nutshell, what are the lessons that we... Because every year we learn lessons, every election we learn lessons. What are these lessons that we will take away from a Doe election and make sure the Ondo and other elections that are off-cycle as well, we do better as a people, not just uh, the INEC now, but all of us are involved in this, in this matter. So what are these lessons that we need to take away to make our electoral system better? I think for the people, the lesson is very clear. You know, this is a vicious cycle. If you allow politicians to buy your votes today, they have they have given you, they have paid for it. And so they're going to eventually um, run their affairs of state in a manner to, uh, you know, to, to make profit. You know, because leadership should actually be about the people. But if the people themselves have now allowed politicians to you know, by their vote. That is a big problem. And so you will have the moral justification to complain when they're not doing well enough. So the people must actually, you know, uh, rethink this uh, idea of allowing politicians to go away with their mandates, uh, on, on, you know, with peanuts. Yes, I understand the economic situation that everybody's facing in the country, but why are we facing this economic situation? Is it because we have bad leaders? And why are we having bad leaders? It is because, you know, the people allow the bad leaders to scale through once they are able to bring in uh, peanuts like they did in this election. So the lesson for the people is that the only way out of this vicious cycle it is, is for us to stand up to the politicians and do what is right at all times. And the other thing is that we need to invest in voters' education. A lot of people don't really understand the impact of these elections. And that's why you see that the, good turn, the turnout in this election was so poor and abysmal. You know, that even a donor that is not supposed to be uh, half of what the vote you get in a do central, uh, you know, had more votes than a do, a do south. And so you can see that, that you know, the, the people need to be educated on the issue of uh, vote buying, on how to vote, on the import of, of elections. But unfortunately, we are not doing much in that regard. INEC needs to find a way uh, to control the way and manner politicians spend money for elections. You cannot have an unrestrained post, allow politicians to be unrestrained in the way and manner, you know, um, they disburse these funds and, and all of that. And then we must all continue to cry out because we can't continue to allow uh, the, the state capture by those in power using security agencies uh, to uh, overwhelm the people, uh, to overwhelm the, the process and then to get their way. Uh, we, we have to make sure that the security agencies, we have independent institutions that can, you know, and ultimately, the most important in all of this mix is the judiciary. The lesson we have learned is that politicians are, are, are picking on the loopholes that the judiciary, judiciary has always, you know, left in the decisions that we have seen in the past. And so the politicians look, find a way to manipulate the process in such a way that when they go to court, it will not affect the outcome of the election. So the judiciary must wake up and, you know, the judiciary must begin to do you know, there are ways, you know, the, our laws can be creatively interpreted to suit the needs of the people. But what we have seen in the past, in the past, is that the judiciary has been used to interpret the law in such a way that, you know, as to embody politicians in this outright manipulation of elections. And so we have, we all have to appeal to the judiciary, uh, you know, to always uphold the law. Let's any once there is an, a case of irregularity in our elections. Then I next should be the one to justify it. It shouldn't be my business to prove it. Once I can show that there's irregularity, then the judiciary should be able to do the right thing so that, uh, you know, in the next election, politicians will not be, will be worried. You know, right now they are not worried. They feel that whatever they do at the moment will be uh, given a, a pat in the back by the judiciary. So these are some of the issues that we need to look at and lessons uh, we need to learn going forward. All right. Uh, well, it's a good way to drop it this, this today. Uh, well, I think um, in the coming days, we'll see what actions will be taken by PDP. They have, they have uh, promised to go to court. They have not yet mm. gone to court. Maybe they're putting their acts right. And uh, we'll see how it, it pans out and know what is going to maybe 
uh, use that as an idea of what is going to come in Ondo and other places that have off-cycle elections. But at this point, we'd like to thank you, Barrister, for coming on the show this morning. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be talking to Barrister Elvis Asia, a legal practitioner. We we're looking at uh, a DO election, a DO, a DO governorship election, uh, in which uh, uh, the candidate for the APC has been declared winner so far, but other parties are aggrieved and they say they're heading to court, especially the P People's Democratic Party. Let's see how that happens and that, how that pans out. We'll take a break now, and when we return, we'll be looking at the fact that Kogi women have protested and accusing EFCC of persecuting Yahaya Bello. That will be an interesting one. Stay with us. <laughs>